So um, we're here in Rosyth. Um, I'm here with um, Antonio and Kevin, uh, working with Discovery and Refit. Um, I don't know if you could like to introduce yourselves and tell you tell the viewers what you do, and sort of also like um, your jobs here in Rosyth. Yeah, uh, my name's Antonio Gatti. I'm captain of uh, Discovery. Uh, I'm in charge of the overall safety of the ship while we're here and all the personnel on board. Uh, keep, keep an eye on the work that's going on along with Kevin and my senior officers. Yes, yeah, so I'm Kevin Williams, the uh, head of research ship engineering. I'm uh, technically managing the, the, the refit at, and the docking at the moment. Um, responsible for pretty much all the program management of, of all the contractors and the work with uh, Babcocks. Okay, so it's, uh, it's really impressive to see the ship here. Um, obviously the refits are really important, but could you give us an example of what they're for and how they work within the ship sort of world? Yes, yeah, so the five-year cycle of uh, ship certification um, works that after every five years you have to do a renewal certificate. Um, this is the 10-year special docking for the, the discovery. Pretty much all the underwater hull will be looked at and we're currently looking at it now. The propulsion, uh, thickness readings, uh, all, all tanks will be opened up and hopefully one of the engines will be overhauled as well. Excellent. So Antonio, it's, uh, it's impressive to see the ship like this, but I can imagine getting it from outside in here is quite a complex process. So could you give a go through how that sort of happens? It is quite tricky, um, although Discovery is very manoeuvrable with her propulsion fore and aft, so we came in without the aid of tugs under our own power. Uh, stern first, uh, we backed into the, uh, into the dry dock itself under my control and with the pilot. Uh, once we are inside then we uh, secured into, into the dry dock afloat, uh, make sure everything's okay with the ship, everything's secure, and then we look at pumping out the water from the dry dock to take us down to what you can see actually sitting on the blocks. It's quite a slow process but uh, we managed to get down on the blocks, perfect first time, lined up correctly, checks made by divers so we're going so we came down okay and the the whole process went very well so kevin i know this is a like it's been a long time planning this so although it's quite a short period so could you go through when you started thinking about this sort of refit so so the special docking normally starts at least a couple of years previous to the docking because you want to make sure the, the availability for parts services um, then a year from the the last refit uh, you sort of know what you're going to be doing for the for the upcoming refit um, it takes time getting contractors we've organized in excess of about 35 subcontractors myself that's excluding what uh, Babcock's employs so it's quite a bit of a coordination yes it's, it's a definitely a big workup so it must be very different for the crew being here on um, in the dry dock rather than at sea. So how does that, what do they do when they're here in the dry dock and how does that compare to being at sea? Yeah, sure. The biggest uh, biggest change for is we don't have any people on watches as such. The fixed watch, seagoing watches, there's no need for that here. We're not, we don't have people on the bridge uh, throughout the day, obviously navigating. But it gives us a good chance then to get on with a lot of fabric maintenance work during the day. We still have... Uh, uh, a couple of night watchmen for security reasons in the evening, fire rounds, that kind of thing. But generally everybody's working day work and it gives us a good chance to get to parts that we can't normally do at sea. And also get to equipment that's all running at sea, but here everything's off, we're on shore power. It just gives us that chance to really get stuck into the areas where we don't normally get to. So I believe there's a crew change happening as well? Yeah, so we've got a crew change in a couple of weeks. Uh, the ship will be refloated by then, so we won't be handing the ship dry. Uh, but there'll be a full crew change in a couple of weeks and the new team coming on that'll be up the work outside will be handed over to them. Yeah, is that more complicated having the crew change mid refit? It can be. Um, the, the, the ideal normally perhaps the whole team would do the refit but because of the crew and schedule for the year and the science programme the crew change has fallen mid towards the end of the refit so uh, but uh, with people being on board and also we have a couple of people staying on with the next team as well so we do have the continuity there as also okay yeah so uh, we've been talking about the people working on here so kevin you've mentioned other subcontractors and all the rest of it so could you give us a flavor of who's actually working on the ship at the moment uh so we've got the propulsion is uh, watsilla we've got engines watsilla uh Konsberg. we've got shields environmental for the the cabins uh, 
We've got Iron Me. T's white, T's white gill for the thrusters, yeah. So um, pretty much every piece of equipment we use OEMs. Uh, with that comes their own team. Yeah. And, and how's it going? From my point of view, it's going okay. Uh, with every reef, it's the same. Teething troubles in the beginning, a little bit of uh, us getting to know the yard, the yard getting to know us, how we operate. This is a new contract, as, as we know, with Babcock here in Recythe. But uh, generally, it's going okay, moving in the di right direction. There's always a feeling at this stage, halfway through, where you think things won't come together, but they always do in the end. And uh, yeah, at the moment, we're quite positive about the whole, uh, how things are progressing. Excellent. And, and what's next for Discovery? So Discovery from here, we have a, there'll be a few days of post-refit trials. Obviously, the ship's been out of the water. We've had work on the generators, work on thrusters, so they will all need putting through the paces at sea. Uh, that'll be for a few days, a couple of days, and the ship's going up to Dundee to take part in the 100th anniversary of the original the Discovery 1 uh, up in D at the Heritage Centre there. So it'll be, no, it's going to be really exciting to have dis, uh, the latest uh, line of Discovery research vessel with the original one. Um, so there's the weekend in there for public visits, access, uh, a few events uh, uh, with the Heritage Centre. Then the ship's uh, back down to Southampton, back to Homeport outside NOC. And then we're out on some trials then with, uh, with some autonomy trials, auto sub trials out at the Wittard Canyon in the southwest approaches. Looking ahead into the summer, we're looking at then an expedition up towards Norway, Tromso and around Svalbard and then across to Canada. So we've got a full year and uh, going to some uh, different places, uh, which is always good for us. Yeah, it's another exciting programme. So uh, I know that the discovery is here in um, Babcock, but the um, uh, the James Cook's not being refit here, and I believe there's some very major work which is happening in, in Dammon for yes. the refit for the James Cook. So the propulsion motor is due to be overhauled. The, the previous propulsion motor was done two years ago, and the other one needs to be done uh, this year. That work will be undertaken by Dammon in, in Amsterdam. They have history with the vessel. They've done it previously. There's, there's lessons learned from that. Uh, the motor uh, OEM is in Rotterdam, so it makes sense to have that project done there. Alan will undertake that project. And it's, it's quite major surgery on the ship, isn't it? You have to cut a huge hole in the side to remove... Yeah, the motor, I believe, is about 60 tonne. Uh, so it, it needs to be supported. The area needs yeah. to be supported. Uh, the switchboards need to come out before the motor can be lifted and, and lifted out the side of the ship yeah. and then putting it all back the same way. Uh, yeah. not, not straightforward. I mean, it's amazing that you can actually do that level of modification to the ship sort of in refit because it's like cutting a huge hole in the side of your car to remove things to then put back in. So it's, it's, you know, it'd be an impressive thing to watch, I'm sure. Yeah, it will be, it will be quite impressive by when, when it's done. Yeah. And Antonio, the, um, what are the differences between the Discovery and the, uh, the James Cook? From the outside, they look very similar, a very similar design. Um, I guess the, the Discovery being seven years later than uh, James Cook, 2006 to 2013, little changes on the inside, distribution of laboratories, equipment carried on board. And also we're slightly bigger, we're uh, 100 metres long, about 10 metres longer, a little bit wider, uh, a little bit deeper as well. So it's just uh, an evolution really of, the, of what lessons learned from the James Cook and then put onto Discovery in terms of design. Also propulsion is com completely different, whereas James Cook is a traditional vessel, if you like, with engines, gearboxes, shaft, propeller and rudder, we're manoeuvred or prop uh, propulsion over azimuth thrusters. So basically propellers that have their own motor and they turn 360 degrees, but also give their propulsion the forward or the stern movement to the vessel. Likewise on the bow, we have two azimuth thrusters as well, which help the ship, makes the ship really manoeuvrable. Uh, are there any differences in the sort of science capabilities that they offer? They're very similar. They're, they're, they're both fitted with, a, with very similar equipment. Although James Cook does have a bit more capability when it comes to seismics due to space and on, on the after end. But generally overall, the ships are very similar. That's, that's good. Um, so final question, Kevin. I know there's a load of work which is being done to reduce the, the carbon outputs from the ships. And so I wonder if you could go through some of the things at which we're looking at in the sort of, in the near to medium term to actually improve the carbon efficiency for the ships. 
So in the near term, uh, we are trialing HVO, which is hydro-treated vegetable oil, uh, it, on the James Cook hopefully this year. And towards the end of this year, we, we might get another trial done on the, the, the discovery as well. Uh, hydro-treated vegetable oil is a drop-in fuel, yeah. which will bridge the gap between um, future shipping. But we're also doing some uh, energy efficiency measures on board the, sh the, the discovery at the moment, and hopefully the James Cook in Amsterdam, uh, like fit and vessel insights, that will give us a better understanding of, of where we can reduce and, and, and save uh, fuel, which ultimately saves uh, sulfur. Yeah. Um, we, we also have plans to uh, look into hybrid battery solutions. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's an ongoing process, but, but it one thing leads on to another and uh, yeah. hopefully by the end of, of 2025 we, we will hit our 40 percent carbon reduction yeah. and then eventually go on to to full net zero shipping in the future yeah it's, it's interesting times for sort of that reduction in in co2 from uh, the marine vessels uh, so thank you very much again for your time and um, yeah thanks very much thank you